So it's a welcome from me again. I'm Jenny Campbell. I'm the chief exec of the Resilience Engine. Um, it's a company uh, set up on the basis of 10 years of research into resilience. So um, we have rather a lot in our heads around it. Uh, and we are delighted. This is our fourth year um, partnering with the Academy of Executive Coaching and offering that resilience research um, to coaches, whether internal or external, um, to be able to use in your own practice. And every year we are delighted to come in and uh, sort of get in and around um, some recent uh, data with you. So uh, that's what we're going to be covering today. Um, we've had, um, I think, over 200 uh, people come in on the survey, um, which we sent, which had a couple of questions around the demand of resilience. Um, and um, before we kind of go into that, some of the results are, are um, not just surprising, but a bit shocking for me, actually. So I think... Um, you know, really lean into this, look at the data, uh, consider what you might do for yourself or your client around this. Um, it's quite serious. So, um, you know, we'll get in and around your questions on it within this 45 minutes. But anything thereafter, as Vicky said, we will be um, answering your questions afterwards. Um, before we go into this, I, I do want to um, use the frame from one of our research models. It's called the Resilience Dynamic, and I'm just going to bring it up for you. Um, I get control over my screen. Um, it's around what is resilience, um, and there'll be many definitions. If you just sit and think about your own definition of resilience, I wonder what that might be. Some of you might be thinking about coping, some of you think about surviving, um, some of you might be thinking more around coming through challenge and coming back. Um, others may have different definitions that are things that are in perspective maybe and humour. Uh, all of these things contribute to resilience. Um, and one of the things I think our research does is provide a contiguous definition. It's a holistic definition that takes into account everything from not coping all the way through to high performance. And we do it via this um, diagram here in front of you, um, the resilience dynamic. So we say, first of all, that resilience is our ability to reshape ourselves. Okay, so it's our ability to reshape, and in fact, it's a, the measure of resilience is a measure of your capacity for change. Now, if you think about that within a coaching context, if you're a coach and you're working with a client and they are needing to change, whether that's behaviour, values, you know, focus, um, lifestyle, uh, whatever it is that they're actually um, looking for within the coaching, it requires change. So resilience is one of these things that is absolutely at the bedrock of what you could be thinking about within your practice is, does the client have capacity for that change? Independent of whether they want to go for it, whether their organisation wants to really drive it, um, actually, in truth, and in reality, do they have capacity right now for that? And if they don't, how could you help them build enough resilience in order to have capacity for that change? Um, so that's the very first part about it. And let me explain some of these, um, these circles that you can see. There are three main states of resilience. Um, that's shown in breakdown, break even and breakthrough. So breakdown, it's where there's no resilience. It coincides completely with the clinical breakdown. It's where there's a catastrophic inability to access your resources. Um, difficult place. It's actually a place of renewal. Interestingly, it's a place you can coach from. Um, for those of you who are wondering about the lines between therapy and resilience, um, resilience coaching, your good questions, and we bring them into the accreditation. Uh, but breakdown is a, is a complex area. It's a complex area because of loss. Um, but interestingly, it is transparent. Um, the client has something. They may have been in their doctors. They're signed off sick. 
Um, and it's actually clear that there is something really complex that has happened to them and they need to recover from that. So that is about recovery. Um, so that's breakdown. If we go to the next sort of main state, break even, and you can see the words coping and bounce back around that, that's where things are okay. Um, no great shakes, there's nothing massive going on in terms of sort of real high performance or, or kind of transformation, um, but things are okay, it's satisfactory. Um, one side of which is coping, that's just about managing to handle all the things you have to do. Um, you're probably left with very little energy at the end of the day, but you are managing. Okay, um, bounce back is higher than that. It's a higher level of resilience where you can kind of push through um, a challenge or a setback and you come back from it. Okay, now normally it requires a great level of energy so you can go up and then it actually has a tail effect on the back end, which means you're very tired. Um, and of course, if you have too many of them, and you, for those who are watching me on screen, uh, you're seeing my hands go up and down. For those who are coming in on my phone, if you imagine just a wiggly line, like a wave, you're going up and down and up and down and up and down, and it's really tiring. Um, so bounce back um, is incredibly you know, helpful, many challenges in life. It's a place where high performance um, is often assumed. You know, you get high talent. Uh, in here, many, many organisations applaud this. Um, there's almost a bit of hero uh, worshipping in here. Um, you get through it, it's fantastic, you've made it, everybody celebrates, um, but nobody really wants to see that tail end. It is a high level of resilience, but it's not as high as you can be. And the third level is breakthrough. Breakthrough, um, and there's a long line between bounce back and, and breakthrough, it's called the whoosh. A technical term for you and it feels a wish going up and it can feel a wish going back down you can slide easily um, but breakthrough is where fundamentally you're at ease you're at ease no matter what the context you're at ease and you can get hold of all the resources available to you whether they're internal or external it's where you've got the highest level of options it's where you can consider proactively you're less reactive in this state. So you're resourceful, you're adaptable, you're thinking about different ways to do things and you remain energized, so motivated and persistent together. Okay, so that's the level and around sort of halfway through along the whoosh and upwards is where you get really high performance. Um, but interestingly, you get high performance and sort of that wisdom that your granny might have <laughs> um, where you're really at ease, okay? So there's less effort um, and there's less sort of resistance, if you like. Um, there's a lot more about adapting and proacting, okay? Um, there's one last state on this diagram, which is fragmentation. Um, we discovered this state as a really clear uh, resilient state um, a number of years ago now but post the original research and we call it fragmentation it's where things begin to break up um, but you've not broken down so it's the kind of state individually where you might start to get unwell um, you keep catching things your immunity system is down you feel fractious you feel fretful um, you're you know you might be narky angry unexpected um, if you have somebody in your workplace or at home who is uh, in this state, they'll be one day they'll be fine and another day they won't. Uh, so there'll be a lot of unpredictability about how somebody's reaction is. Um, in teams, it's where issues are tucked away. There are elephants in the room all over the place and nobody's actually addressing them. And there can be fragmentation of the team into different factions. Um, even at an organisational level, you can see this. Um, so that kind of whole contiguous line is quite new, and we haven't seen it anywhere else actually in research where you can actually really see that the different stages of resilience, you have to go from fragmentation through to coping, through to bounce back, and then you can move up. Um, so it has quite strong implications for us as coaches. Um, so let me stop there and say, um, do you have any questions straight off the bat on that uh, before we go on to then looking at the results of the survey? Um, 
Vicky, it's possibly easier to go into the chat room, would you say, rather than a Q and A? I'm not quite sure. You can do either. I'm keeping keeping an eye on both. So okay, lovely. No questions yet. Yeah. So, anyone got any questions about the resilience dynamic? Is it the same as what you have been thinking for yourself and your clients, for example? Um, yep. You got that, sorry. <laughs> and and do yeah. we do, yep. So um, and to emphasize that point, that those who are in breakthrough are automatically thinking plan A, plan B, plan C, plan, plan D. Okay, so they are actually really able and are almost sort of able to imagine resolutioning. So whilst persisting in the outcome of what they're looking for, and they'll really give a go on one option, okay, at the same time and equally they will expect potentially to have to have an option B or an option C. Okay, hope that helps. Any other questions that you might have at this stage? So, um, have you seen the question from Matthew? Um, it's presented as a flow or a sequence. Is that what you intended? Um, it is presented. It's, I mean, flow is a very optimistic word, Matthew. Um, it definitely is quite sequential. So, for example, um, if you are at a high level of resilience and actually end up in coping, you'll have probably been going through bounce back behaviour where you've been trying to push through something. Okay. Um, the other way around, you can't go from coping to breakthrough without actually really learning how to get through challenges. And thereafter, then it's about how to stabilise um, your energies associated with that. And then, and then, and then. Yes. Yeah, so it is actually a sort of sequence. Um, uh, that sounds quite logical because in the reality and when you're living it, it feels a bit like it, it, it's quite dynamic and that's why we actually call it the resilience dynamic. Um, so, great questions. Anyone else? Any other questions? The y-axis is not energy level. Um, thanks for that question. Um, Energy is related to resilience. It actually follows the same um, ups and downs. And it's actually the nearest proxy to resilience that you can have. Um, so if you're thinking about your own resilience as a coach, for example, or you're wondering about a client that you have, um, one of the signs to read is your own energy levels. If your energy is low, your resilience will be lower. It doesn't mean to say it's low or rock bottom. Um, because there are other contributing factors. Um, so resilience is your capacity for change is the way that I would really encourage you to think about it. Um, time lag, absolutely. Um, so illness, retirement, any context that's there. So those with the highest resilience will absolutely, um, th th there's been nothing fixed here, James. So um, somebody at the highest of the level of resilience may actually incur sort of some kind of difficulty like illness that will push them down again um, on that resilience dynamic and um, what they will be doing is really accepting that and really accepting the time that they need within that okay which is an interesting thing for the results that are coming up uh, through this um, the demand on resilience in the workplace because time um, and people expect people to recover really quickly and then just push on. So um, definitely, uh, definitely the idea of appropriate time. Um, we could give a completely different example. Um, resilient behaviour may be being able to take pretty tough feedback in a meeting and being able to notice your reaction. You might even have anger, um, but be able to assimilate that choose whether you actually act from that anger, anger or whether you remain in a different kind of state and deal with the anger outside, okay? So you, you are not rendered unresourceful in that moment and high performers would react like that. So that's no time lag, okay? In that kind of momentary, momentary aspect. Um, yeah, so everyone can work to the highest level unless there is something um, like a chronic illness that you have, uh, Sarah. Um, so if you have a long-term situation which you're having to cope with, you can be at a high level of resilience, 
but it would be unlikely that you would be the absolute highest that you could ever be. Um, so, you know, those suffering from ME, for example, have a long term um, illness and, you know, I've had ME myself and I knew what I was like before and during ME, even though I might be able to really, I was a high performer actually in the oil industry at the time um, and did go back to work, etc. But I was still kind of feeling quite drained from the ME until I recovered from that. So, um, you know, they're definitely... Uh, real contextual aspects uh, to life. In terms of other obstacles, um, you know, a lot is in, in, inside sort of the deeper um, psychological um, drivers that you may have. Um, so I'm not sure whether you would be uh, talking about them as obstacles or opportunities as a coach. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, an interesting thing, and so um, I, I'm going to move on from, from your questions on that. Um, really to ask you now another question, and I really would like as many responses as possible, is this diagram is related to, can be related to any individual, any team, any organisation, any, any collective context, okay? Uh, so it's really, really valid for your thinking as a coach on behalf of yourself on behalf of your clients, but I'm actually interested if you took one of your clients that you're working with today, right? whether you're an internal or external coach, what would their workplace be like? What level of resilience right, are you observing um, around your client's workplace in relation to the resilience dynamic? Where is that workplace? Is it a coping? Is it not coping? Is it near fragmentation? Is it in the middle? That'd be great if you can actually um, post your thoughts. So Rose is first up with coping. That's great. Mm. Another coping going towards fragmentation for those who can't see the screen. I know there's 38 of you, so please don't be shy. I'd be really interested in your views on this. Um, and if you're not quite sure what to do, you have a black uh, sort of little toolbar and you can enter into the chat room. Um, it's where many, many people are going into. So breakthrough for Matthew. I mean, that's a delight to hear, actually. Um, break even on coping side. Bounce back, yeah, lots of organisation in that kind of currently multiple challenges, getting through, getting through, especially if there's high meaning. Break even, doing okay, but probably there's a bit of oscillation between coping and bounce back. Um, emerging from bounce back, sounds great. <laughs> Interested in that one, Catherine. Um, yeah, clients, James is saying I have a client who blocks out difficulties. Um, and that is actually a potential stress reaction, James. So, and stress is extremely exhibited from coping um, and coping and fragmentation. So we can discuss at another point uh, where you know, the stress reactions are, etc. But that freeze is one of the stress reactions. So it may be related um, and it's definitely one of the signs you would learn as an accredited practitioner, how to finesse what you get here. Um, between coping and, and fragmentation, break down. Now. So that's a serious, very serious issue. Um, Organisations who are breaking down are in real disarray and uh, it's incredibly difficult to hold any containment of that. Um, in fragmentation, if an organisation's in fragmentation, often uh, it's a command and control that is, is kicked in in order to be able to get back to coping. Um, the coping isn't necessarily brilliant, but it's a lot, lot better than fragmentation. Um, so, so many thanks for that. And I think, you know, you see here out of the number of responses that we have so far in here, um, that there's an awful lot around coping. And I think that's actually played out in, in the results of the survey. So I would like to go on to that now. Thank you very much for everybody for, for actually inputting. And it really is very rich when you start to relate it to your own self, potentially, you know, you're an internal coach or internal OD practitioner, what's it going, you know, what's the implication for yourselves around here? And um, what's the implication of the ask of your employees? 
You know, are you asking for change when actually there's very little capacity for change? Okay, so change, just to come back to this, change is possible really only from the middle point of break even. Right, that's pretty shocking. All right, so if your organization, your client's organization is at that coping level, there's a tremendous drain on resilience that's happening. And if the ask performance wise is to be in change and to be leading change or to enacting on change and there's no capacity, then there's a set up to fail syndrome here going on. Um, and it's quite serious, and it's serious for us as coaches and LD professionals to sort of really be aware and, and help on that. So um, let me go on uh, to the, the first result. Um, so we asked um, this question. And here is the sort of different results. So what, you know, what level of resilience are you are, is in the workplace? What's the demand on the, on the level of resilience? And is it moving? Okay. And you can see that there's 44% of people are seeing that the demand is high and growing. And there's 38% that says it's high and it's remaining high. So it's incredibly big. That number is huge. And if we look at the other side of this, um, there's only 10% that are in that kind of, okay, it's just about manageable. Right? So if you really look at this, number 82 percent of those that we have surveyed say that the resilience demands are high and and for us now that's quite a shocking number um we have been uh, doing this resilience research now for many many years and we are tracking um not in quantitative levels but in qualitative um levels with uh, with all of our clients um, sometimes in surveys like this, etc. And we are seeing a shift from the world in the middle of break even um, to coping and then not coping. And that's what this number, it's the first time that we are seeing a number that is absolutely verifying that kind of shift. Um, and it has very strong implications therefore for change. And in a world which is a bucka world, it's volatile and uncertain and complex and where we're having to navigate change all the time, there's a real mismatch here. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone's sort of um, reacting to that now. Uh, do you have a similar exclamation mark when you see that number? Is that something you would have expected? Um, how, what, what, what are your thoughts? Um, please post them in again into the chat room. We'd be really, really, really keen to see that. Um, perennial distractions, fractures, attention, sensory overload, absolutely. Um, so um, I think there's been multiple shifts. Um, we're just being asked what's the source of this. Um, you'll see in the next question where some of the sources. Um, so, and I just think this is actually going on at every level. Um, so, we our original research um, was around individuals. Um, so, individuals and caring for their well-being. It's an interesting thing that is really growing. Uh, so, sleep is part of that. Um, but uh, if we take it at team and organisational level and then up to country and then macro picture, you've got a lot of fragmentation going on in structural terms, in clarification of sort of who you are, what the role is, what the organisational mission is, um, what you know, your contribution is within that. And all of these things layered up along with the data age of always on and never switching off. Um, you know, you see the counter forces and things like mindfulness and the push for well-being now much more. And this voice is not strong enough yet. Um, we do applaud hero leadership. We applaud people in the bounce back and getting through. And um, what we hadn't counted on was having to do it again and again and again and again and again. And that is actually what pushes, pushes people to coping and potentially not to coping. Um, so let me just see the others. Um, yeah, Sarah, we agree. It summarises a lot of conversations that uh, you know you're having at the moment. 
um, boundary management, fantastic. Sorry, I can't see um, your name. <laughs> uh, um, whoever wrote that is um, boundary management is a key, key, key part of maintaining resilience and particularly what we call the adaptive capacity. Um, so being able to say no is a friend of resilience. Yes. And uh, in case somebody pushes back on you or your client around that, the um, implication of shifting from bounce back upwards is you can more than double your capacity. Okay, so you can get a lot more done and, and you can be saying no to a lot of the rubbish. Uh, and you'll see this is one of the messages that I'm coming out with today. Um, yeah, mental health completely. Um, what, to, to, to sort of make the connections between the resilience dynamic, that initial diagram, but I'll just go back up onto it, and mental health, I think it's really, really important. Um, so if there's a lot of um, what I would call chronic coping, um, stress is just about manageable, manageable the stress, the, the, the negative stress reaction of cortisol running around your system, you know, the amygdala hijack, etc. And many of us know about that. If you don't know, go and find out. It's really important for your clients. Um, so coping, you can just about manage anything below coping. Um, you start to get into very clearly the boundaries into mental health issues. So depression and anxiety are the first clear ones uh, to, 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 to show up as, as a kind of more general one within the population. Um, so what we're seeing is the lack of resilience is actually triggering mental health. Mental health is absolutely at the heart of fragmentation. Okay, now I'm not talking about mental health, um, um, sort of the clinical side of mental health, but really depression and anxiety, um, which can then of course lead to, to, to more issues. Um, so you're absolutely right, this is, this is really relating mental health right in here. Um, yep, so relationships, so that's a brilliant intervention, Laura, around relationships with team members. And actually, we know that um, teams really foster resilience. They're the heart, you know, and blood of that. Um, so connecting, you know, emotionally um, to both why you're there, but also the support that you get is fantastic. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the very obvious that Becky is seeing more and more demand on fewer and fewer people. And you'll see that in the, in the next slide. Um, so if I do go on to that... Um, so this question too was around what drives the demand for resilience in your workplace, okay? The biggest one is this change in structure in your organisation, it's the one in navy blue. Uh, for those listening on the phone, it's 21%. But what is really interesting, um, sorry, I should say that the, the next one, just for those who aren't uh, looking at this and, and are only getting on the telephone, um, the next one up is long working hours. And the one, you know, further down from that is lack of clarity of role. Now, if, if you actually really think about structural change in an organisation, which is the highest driver uh, of demand, if you add in the lack of clarity that can happen as a result of that, that's the big whopper. Okay, so that's the biggest combination. You know, it's the biggest contributor. Um, to the demand on resilience is structural change and lack of role clarity. Does that make sense for people? Again, any questions on that? I might take a little time to think about it. Think about your clients here. Think about whether they're seeing, they know what they're about. Do they know what the ask is of them? And if the organisation is changing and not clear on its ask, you know, is the client, is your individual client being given enough autonomy and authority to actually rediscover and, and kind of put that forward for themselves? Any, any thoughts on, on reactions to this one? Maybe you're already thought out. <laughs> it's quite big stuff. Definitely. Definitely security, definitely resonating. So interesting, isn't it? Having clear roles are important. Yes, they are. Um, within a team, our latest research is around team uh, resilience. And one of the um, key drivers of a team's resilience is role clarity. 
um, and contribution of role in the team being really recognised and applauded, if you like. Um, so if the boss is sitting down on somebody and not letting them flourish, they are not building the resilience of the team, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think probably for us all, it's really interesting as coaches. Um, and voice. So if anyone's working with women, having your voice heard within a team. You know, the Google research shows that the, the team resilience is a major contributor to team performance. Um, so having all voices and feeling safe. Uh, and somebody else has said safe as well. So there are many comments coming in here. For those of you who are on the phone, I can't list them all, but I would actually encourage you to go back in and look at the recording. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and in leadership, we so rarely actually revise and relook at roles, okay? We're always kind of expecting people just to go on with the task. Um, so, you know, uh, we have to pause and think about this. We have to pause and think on behalf of our clients about this um, because this is the resilience dream. And again, if we go back to this diagram here, you know, you've got an enormous level of people in that coping or coping and fragmentation world, okay? And they don't have capacity for change. They can't learn. Therefore, the ask of the organization is not possible. So you've got this real dichotomy here that's going on. Um, Self-leadership, thank goodness for us coaches. Yes, there's a lot, a lot of stuff to do here. There's a lot of work involved. Um, and if, if there's any message that I'm giving to you on this, it's actually, if you want to equip yourself uh, with this in more detail and really finesse your practice, because that's what a lot of the resilience coaching is about, is actually making much more clarity um, about your help and intervention in order to build the resilience, in order to then achieve the outcomes. Um, so, you know, you co-creating that with your client is a fantastic thing. Um, and we'd welcome you on the Resilience Accreditation Programme. So, yeah, I mean, so we're really, really seeing very, very significant data. Um, so a few thoughts for you. Um, uh, you know, I'm aware of time. And so a few thoughts for you about what can you do, okay, uh, so the very first thing is, is don't brush this away. This data is, stands out. This is the most shocking data uh, that I have seen around the need for resilience. It's very, very high and it's growing. And, and the 44% is the one, you know, 44% of people said uh, it's high and it's growing. Okay. And so... Taking account of this is really important. Um, for any of you who are watching from an internal uh, point of view, either internal OD or internal um, coach, I would really encourage you to repeat this survey internally. We can help you do that um, so that you actually have your own data. Okay, um, and that's important. It's your own data because it is a call for change. It's a, it's, it's a call for action. Um, and, and you can do something about this. Um, so what can you do very first up when those who are not coping, for those who are not coping, is get real, remove everything that's non-essential. Okay? And that's it, right? If you did nothing else, that would already massively increase people's resilience. Right? So in your coaching practice, um, and this is one of the dilemmas for resilience coaching is the directive, non-directive. You may be holding data on behalf of your client or rather the interpretation of that data or the so what of that data. You, you, the data is coming from the client. They may inherently know this stuff, but they're trying to do all the things that they're currently doing and they may not be achieving any of it and actually contributing to a resilience dream, which will only increase their lack of performance, if you like. So remove all non-essential items. Look at what J.K. Rowling said about writing Harry Potter. No money, went round 12 publishers. That all, how did she manage, you know? And she said, well, you get really good at recognizing what's essential and non-essential. So bringing awareness to that, not being shy of it, not going for big and hairy goals, 
doing the basics. That's a huge part of um, actually the humility, I guess, uh, that we need to hold uh, as coaches. Second one is breathe. <laughs> Create a bit of space. Um, if you're coaching already, uh, doing a mindfulness uh, with your clients, fantastic. Um, those of you who aren't, I would really encourage you to become more finesse in that. Um, do it for yourself. Um, go for walking sessions rather than actually staying behind a desk. Help your clients breathe. Help your clients just be. Being present is one of the core enablers of resilience. Um, so actually doing that, not just talking about it, but doing it with them, really important. Number three, big, big thing in organisational terms, create the space to think. Okay, um, if, you're, if the resilience of the organisation is at coping or, or lower, um, you're not learning. And if you can't learn, there's no change. Okay, full stop. So create the space to create learning conversations. And this could be done just very practically by asking team leaders in any of their agendas and their monthly meetings, weekly meetings or whatever, to put in a five minute slot on, at the beginning and a five minute slot at the end. What, have, what did we learn last week? What are we going to learn this week? How are we learning this, you know, last week? How do we want to learn this week, etc.? Very simple, right? Don't do anything fancy, just to actually encourage people to learn. Um, number four, where there is structural change, get real about it, you know, what the ask is, okay? And if you're coaching people at the leadership level, um, help them see the implications from the resilience dynamic. If you are coming into the accreditation program, you, you will become a fee really with that and, and can bring that to your clients more clearly. Uh, but you're welcome to give it a go off the back end of this. Um, and then very, very importantly, people need autonomy for resilience. Give them authority to act. So you as a coach, for example, um, we are all have a tendency to help. Um, but if we are help and removing the responsibility from the client, we are actually contributing to a resilient dream. So instead, actually really help your client take responsibility. Okay, really, really helpful. So even if they just take responsibility for one thing, getting better sleep, fantastic. It will have no consequences, um, positive consequences for their resilience going forward. Um, and the very last thing I want to sort of leave you with is, is build resilience, um, build your own capacity for it and build it in those around you. So, you know, as as coaches, if we're working with others, um, if you are an OD person, um, you know, aim for the biggest leverage point within the organisation, like managers, potentially leaders, but managers are the absolute bolt hole, or, you know, nuts and bolts of resilience in an organisation. And then they can in turn help energise staff. So energy um, and re-energising is one of the next uh, top enablers of resilience. So... So I'll leave you with that and then, um, and we will send this out. So don't worry if you haven't taken notes or whatever and thinking, oh my God, there were five points. What, you know, I, I won't remember all of them. Um, you, you will get these out. Um, and the last thing is just a sort of um, left, bit of an overview of our resilience accreditation program, which starts on the 5th of February. Um, so it's quite light touch in terms of actual inputs. It's just like two one day workshops and some supervision. Um, but most of it's practice work and supervision work and a ton of actually discussing with, with uh, um, fellow pr practitioners um, and then you get given a license to practice with the models both the one that you've seen on the resilience dynamic but also the resilience engine uh, which is how to build resilience. So a bit of a whistle stop tour I'm going to pause and uh, and just ask you, so is it ICF approved? Um, it contributes to an ICF. Uh, so I think there's 37 and a half hours um, uh, given on the programme. Vicky, I think we should probably um, uh, confirm that because I may have that number wrong. Um, but it's definitely CCEUs. You get your own um, a certificate from it. Uh, Lisa and therefore can it can contribute towards um, an ICF approved um, uh, accreditation level. Yeah, I'll uh, confirm that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? It's a huge amount actually in that. 
You're all just zazz from the data. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions about resilience? Any questions on behalf of your clients? Thinking about where they are? Thinking about those five points about how to how to you know how to enable. Can I ask a question, Denny? It's a yeah. very a very lay question, really, from a, an outsider. Um, what, is, are there time scales put on working with a client um, in terms of resilience and building their resilience from from bottom up? Uh, not really, not really a predictable one. So it depends on their their start point, really. So you could you could imagine somebody in chronic coping. Um, if they if you if if they would like to shift to a higher level of resilience, you may take a long time because there's long, long, long term habits built up of resisting change and just managing to juggle and expectation setting, etc. Mm. Um, but somebody could be from say you know have shifted job from a high level of resilience and ended up in coping. Um, so they wouldn't have been on the at breakthrough. They'd have been somewhere on the whoosh within their context. But actually, all of a sudden, the rug is pulled from them, and actually, that may be a day, and it may be two years. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And so it's actually about the kind of latent resourcefulness that they already have versus the context in which they are shifting. So. I think that was probably Vicky's phone. So, uh, so let me get back to a few other questions. Uh, so, what one change would I would you ask to increase resilience is being present. So, really, 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 really helping your client be. Because what happens if you're not is you 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 move into your focus, which is incredibly um, short term, um, highly specific over kind of brittle actually and um, for those on the telephone i'm holding my hands up as if i've got um sort of blinkers around my eyes it's a blinker view if you help somebody be present you immediately are creating um, more openness okay and that is the bedrock for creating options so i hope that's that's helpful and then carrying on we will send you information about mindfulness uh, Caroline, there's multiple domains uh, that you can go in and actually learn about them um, and actually really becoming a mindfulness practitioner is a fab thing. Um, yes, uh, James, brilliant for this. So um, we have really come across this over the many, many years. Um, you're being told to be more resilient is essentially crap because actually you're being told to just put up or shut up, um, you know, And but it's not, okay? So if you know, you encourage whoever it is you're working with to actually, you know, think about it as your capacity for change. A person who is really seeing no capability and resisting and brittle doesn't have capacity for change and they need those first two things, being present and energy, okay? And it, they are transformative. If they go up, your client's resilience will go up and the potential of it not being crap, you know, decreases, okay? Um, so I hope that's helpful, James. What's worth in getting buy-in to investment uh, from exec teams? So um, real stuff, uh, resilience dynamic is very helpful for that. Um, real data, uh, easy to enact a two-question survey. Um, you know, we've done it. We've got two hundred people's input, and you know, we've got great results. Um, looking at the resilience dynamic and getting them to connect with themselves and where their teams are. Um, and actually the pragmatic nature of how you can get in and around it. So while some of it, some of resilience coaching is in that deeper psychological space, some of it is, is just real pragmatism. Um, it's about vision, clarity, um, prioritisation, saying no, um, you know, boundaries. It's really pragmatic and therefore can be worked on without too much ickiness. Uh, so I hope that's that's helped on that one. Um, lots of questions, guys. It's fantastic, uh, and lots of varying questions. So you know, it's really nice to 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 see your interest. Thank you for it. Um, I am aware of time. 
I am aware probably you have others. Uh, so if there aren't any more questions, I would fire them in, even if we're not going to respond to them now. Um, and we do promise to come back to you. So as I say, um, we'd be delighted to work with you, um, you know, and uh, um, we leave you with these ideas and uh, may your resilience be with you. <laughs> um, so many thanks for, for today's session. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And Jenny, thank you very much for being the, the expert in resilience and, and spending an hour with everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. It's always very nice to get a little bit of feedback. <laughs> so.